right. You ready for our first show, Phil? Yeah, uh, this is our first show on what we call it, Suturing History. Is that suturing right? Time. Is that suturing right? time. Suturing time. Well, okay. <laughs> so, well, what, what, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, the reason I talked about this is that I have lived through a lot of history. And some of the history that I've lived through, you read about in books, but then you sort of forget about it because you forget the book. But nevertheless, it would have shaped your life. I can think of, uh, I can think of, well, maybe maybe the best example for me is the Vietnam era. You know, I lived through it. I was too fat to get in the army. The one thing I can tell you about it is nobody wanted to go and everyone I knew from my high school class figured if they could and if they had the right language to do it, a way not to go. And a whole lot of people who had no interest in hell at all in being a conscientious objector, objector found themselves sitting and studying with the Quakers so they could come up with the right magic words that wouldn't get their wouldn't get themselves shot away is what I mean to say. I mean, it was like a historical hand that gripped into your life. And if your number was up, you were gonna go. That's just an example. So we'll, re we'll reach by certain of our experiences, maybe something we studied in class like Walter Benjamin, and we'll look at it not in the classroom, but in the real world of our experience and see if we can find manifestation of what he's talking about. Yep, across times, kind of suturing across time. Yeah, and in, in a way, in a way, and we we want to we want to reach people. We're, we're we're almost we're almost like time lords in a way. We might go, but we might go back and say, well, this happened in Germany. This happened in Germany Germany in 1932. The Nazis won a re uh, an election, and nobody expected everything to change within six months. Well, if it happened then, could it happen here? You know, I mean, I, I noticed, for example, most people haven't heard of the, well, they don't, they don't know that the, the, the Nazis started a rebellion in the German city of Munich. And just as uh, Trump said, storm the Capitol, Hitler said, storm the parliament in Munich. We're going to take it over. There's going to be a revolution of the people. And people said, Hitler, you're crazy. And then they put all these Nazis in jail. And Hitler was like, going on with his raves and stuff that you see in Mein Kampf. And said, somebody said, shut up, he's crazy. Make him shut up, he's crazy. And someone else said, Rudolf Hetz said, well, history, Hitler, instead of bothering us about this stuff, why don't you write a goddamn book about it? And that's where mine came from. And it took a guy like FDR to read it and read that in the unexpurgated, unexpurgated edition, it was a terrifying thing because basically the Nazi philosophy was kill everybody that's not German and take their land and live off of it. And so what we always have to be careful about as citizens and democracy is how quick things can flip. And sometimes for the most terrifying, crazy, unlikely people. I guess I got a little excited. No, that's that. good. Cause um, so that's one of the themes I kind of extracted from his work and we'll kind of back up and talk about um his book and him and everything like that but one of his themes was how fascism can aestheticize politics so um that's kind of exactly what you're saying we kind of saw it in real life on january 6th yeah good good yeah anyway, we and and i i have i have a huge amount of papers and one of those papers actually deals well, what you're talking about, uh, aesthetics for the Nazis was an aesthetic to die for. 
And what, what you don't think about is there were millions of ordinary Germans that died because of what the Nazis, what, what, in order to defeat the Nazis, you had to destroy Germany physically. And that's, and that's what the, the, the Nazi aesthetic could only end in death, a celebration of death. You know, that was what he thought about, he thought about war and capitalism. And we, you, you can't give up because it, it, it'll flip. I guess that that's what it can flip very easily, you know. And, and all we have is these fragile institutions and concerned citizens, you know. Yes, the pendulum I mean, that swings too far. Well, yeah, but its and, weight carries it back the other way at some point. And I, I. I, I'm, I'm going to take something that I heard. On, Jan and I were watching a show, Bones. It's a forensic pathologist kind of team. It's kind of a, it's it's kind of a good show, but the thing that came up is the pendulum swings one way, and it's a pendulum. It's like something aesthetic, and maybe you make something powerful and movie moving, like the movie Triumph of the Will. It's a Nazi movie. But then when it swings back the other way, it's a wrecking ball, mm. and the wrecking is war. The wreckage is war. If if you take that a little farther, there's a guy named Joseph Schumpeter, who talks about the creative destruction of capitalism, and you actually you can actually see that. But now we're now the wrecking ball is hitting the planet. I didn't mean to get so. You know. <laughs> No, it's good. So maybe I should. Uh, so Phil had the idea of, of uh, doing the show on Walter Benjamin or Benjamin, you know, Benjamin, I guess they pronounce it Benjamin. But um, maybe I just uh, so I didn't know anything about him. I I uh, I tried to read one of his works and then I watched some, you know, watch some stuff about him. And I'll admit the first time it was just like, whoosh, like straight over my head. Um, but it was good because it made me kind of step back and digest it and then kind of tackle it again. So I wrote down a few notes or thoughts. And, um, you know, for anybody who might be watching, Phil speaks this language, but I really, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a strong background in the humanities. So um, when they, you know, when you start, a lot of this stuff kind of went over my head. So I, it was good because I, I got to learn some new things and I don't know if I fully comprehend it or not, but um, I guess to kind of back up, um, I'll kind of look at my notes, but Walter Walter Benjamin was born in the late 19th century in Berlin, and he was a Jewish philosopher and a Marxist, but not a Leninist. So, and he was a member of the Frankfurt School, and maybe Phil can talk a little bit about what that is in a second, but the reason we were studying Benjamin is um, there was a one of the works that he wrote was called the work of art in the age of its technical reproducibility, and thinking about that, Phil and I thought it might be interesting to discuss art as community rather than as a cult phenomenon, and then we also thought it might be interesting at some point later in the discussion at the end maybe to kind of look at what we discuss and then just see if you could uh, bring Walter Benjamin forward in time to the present, what he would think about the internet and, and non-fungible tokens or NFTs. So I don't know, Phil, if you want to add anything about um, Walter Benjamin, like the Frankfurt School, any of like the philosophy behind that. I mean, I know they're, they were, they're Marxists, but not Leninists. And, you know, a lot, a lot of the you know the stuff i don't have quite frankly don't have the the background to fully appreciate all the subtleties because they used a lot of uh he used a lot of language that requires you to understand to to, to get the full context you need to you know have a kind of a background um that i don't have but i think i appreciated his core points which we'll discuss later but if there's anything you want to add well what i want to add is that you, I, I have papers, lots of papers that I've written, maybe some of them 20 years ago, and they're up on my blog. And now I'm 
rereading them, you know, and I'm reading them in terms of some of Benjamin's formulations. Like, like I'm, I'm a J.R.R. Tolkien scholar. And you, you can look at the Lord of the Rings a lot of different ways. But if you're a Frankfurt Stuhl critical theory, you'd look at it the way that capitalism produces and affects an artistic product and how, how some art, does, art is not autonomous, but it really is out in the real world. It's, it, it's not in the museum. It's sort of in our, the museum of our minds. And given that, I looked back at this paper I wrote, and it was called the, the Curse of the Hobbit. And what it meant was that Tolkien wrote a really successful children's book. And as a matter of fact, they wanted to translate it into German, but they they made they had to make they had to make sure that Hitler wasn't a Jew, or that I'm sorry, that Tolkien wasn't a Jew. You know, because if he was a Jew, then they couldn't publish The Hobbit in, in Germany. And he sent them a na nasty letter back and said, not only am I not a Jew, I hate the Nazis or something like mm. that. But so he, he came out he came out pretty well in the whole discussion. But I guess I guess I, I'm gonna clarify the difference between Marxists and Leninists really quickly. Because Marxism has something in common with Christianity. And what it has in common with Christianity is it's often judged by its worst examples. Now, Marxism is a theory of the way history moves. Leninism is a way of trying to organize a revolution, trying to change a government. And you have to realize that when the Russian Revolution took place, Lenin sure was sure that they were all going to be killed, all of the revolutionaries, because the Russian Revolution was not supposed to happen in Russia, because Russia was too backward, and the world had to go through these different stages of capitalism, and if they didn't, it didn't work. And that may well have been true, but as much as, as communism in the Soviet Union was a failure, the Northern European social democracies have done pretty well. You know, if you, you would probably wouldn't mind living in Norway or someplace like that. And they're, they're socialist and they're to an extent Marxist too. So I, I would say you have to deal with theory and practice both, you know. So when Benjamin's growing up, Mark, he's a student, Marxism is a crazy idea that a few of these Russians have, have. But when Russia basically lost the First World War and the Russian army marched home, suddenly the Leninists were the only ones left to run the government. Mm. So, so a Marxist Leninists are. So it's almost like they kind of inherited by attrition. Yeah, yeah. They were the communists were the last man standing, mm. you know. And as a matter of fact, what I, what I didn't realize is from an epidemiological standpoint, like what the Germans did when the Russian Revolution took place, Lenin was hiding in Switzerland and they sent him in a sealed train through Germany to the, the, the Finland station in Leningrad, Leningrad with the hope that he could undermine this weak Russian government that was being beaten by the Germans. So the German, the Germans definitely contributed to the Russian Revolution because they wanted Russia to be weak. I know I've given you a whole lot of stuff, but it's stuff, if I were teaching, I'd cover this in the first hour, and then we'd go look at Walter Benjamin, and we would say he, he lived as an isolated intellectual in journalism and then there's these things started to happen and the Leninists were actually running a government, you know? It's, it's, right. And it's interesting you're talking about revolution because in a nutshell, I believe 
um, the the book, the work of art in the age of its technical reproduce reproducibility was Benjamin's speculation about the role of art in revolution in yeah. an age where art can be both produced and reproduced mechanically. Yeah. So. And we, we when you speak about the age, age of revolution, the Nazis national social, socialism was horrifically revolution, revolutionary. The Nazis came up with this idea that they were the super race and they were going to, and the world was theirs to take over and everyone else was inferior. I guess the Romans thought that and the Greeks did too. They weren't the first, but these, these old ideas kicked in and it reduced them from, it, it removed any semblance of moral responsibility for your actions. Boy. So once again, sutured so, across time. Sutured across time. And that's what we've been doing. We've been going, you know, this, this is operationally, we're going across and we're saying, you know, we don't want to ignore, ignore this. What, what, what if, what if Pence, what, what if the, somebody like Pence, who I, I don't like the, the vice president would have done what Trump told them to, you know, I mean, and, and that's a funny thing because sometimes it's a, a dweeb who has this great historical responsibility fall on it. it, it yeah, it, it's, it's, it it's me. kind of like I, the 1980s movies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you never, you never expect them to do it. You know, it's like when I, when I, when I was a nihilist and got kicked out of college, I, I really, I, I read this book called is Paris burning. And there was this, uh, I think his name was von Kolt. He was a German general, and he was told to destroy every art museum in in Paris because the Allies were going to liberate it. And he basically he gave Hitler the finger and didn't do it. And they said that there were there were Hitler screamed like a banshee, you know, but he said no. And may, may, maybe that's something that we take out of this. Sometimes it's ordinary people who say no, who, who are by saying no, keep this horrific, horrific thing in effect. And that's really what Tolkien's talking about, Lord of the Rings. You know, his heroes are, are, are the hobbits. They're the only ones that can't be corrupted. Yeah. Wow. We, we, we went through a lot, didn't we? We did. So that's good because... Um it kind of brought it back to what I thought was kind of the nutshell of it. So I don't know if you want to discuss more, we could kind of go through kind of the work just, I guess, from the, you know, thousand foot view, but it kind of, it started off where he discussed the characteristics of art in general. And then yeah. he like quickly transitioned into discussing the effects of the mechanical production of art. And that's where I struggled yeah. the first time through it because it seemed a bit non sequitur and I didn't, really, I think probably because I didn't have the background to understand all the, you know, the, the political stuff. <laughs> um, it seemed non sequitur. Maybe, maybe it actually, it probably wasn't, but um, maybe we should talk about like how he discussed art in general a little bit. And then we can kind of fast forward to how he tied that into the reproducibility. So, okay. so he talked about aura when he was, when he, when he first discussed art generally, he talked about two things. He talked about aura and value and uh -huh. on the aura had a couple of components. One was the authenticity or the uniqueness of the art. Mm -hmm. And the other was the locale, both, both physical and cultural locale. Um, and then the value yeah. basically was broken down into cult, cult value which would be, it's like it's ceremonial or spiritual or religious value. Um, and that was usually kind of kept in a controlled space, like, you know, like a church or it had limited access. And then to tie, you know, to tie it in with that, he had under value, he had exhibition value and that was the display value. So those two things could be at odds with something that was kept, say, within 
within a church or within some. You know. yeah. So, I mean, any any thoughts on how he kind of approached that? Like, we can talk and in a second. We'll kind of we'll we'll kind of branch off and talk about how the reproducive how he felt the reproducibility affected those things. But um, I guess kind of so. Yeah. So go, so go ahead. Well, I took a, le a less than satisfied contemporary, satisfactory contemporary art history course in 2018 from UW Eau Claire. And to give her her due, it was okay for undergraduates, but she had no willingness to, to understand what I was trying to say. For example, there's a, when you talk about exhibition value, you'll find just about every artist thinks the not the career thinks it, it is their goal to fight their way into an exhibition space and to assume that because something is not there that it should be there it's kind of like identity politics only with art you know well why aren't there any you know there's not enough women artists well yeah and so the gorilla, gorilla girls dress up like gorillas and they put that in our face that there's not enough women artists and they're sort of right. But then what happens is the gorilla girls themselves who have been protesting this end up in panels at the Modern Museum of, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art talking about their articulating protests and in a way, they become transformed into what they're opposed to. So what I'm say I'm saying is, there there is a there's a lot to talk about with exhibition space, aesthetic value. I mean, I, I have to go back over these notes, really. But but I do see that in anybody I know, that's an artistic production produ producer, is fighting to get into exhibition space. Because that's almost the the only way they think that's the only way to validize themselves, and we ain't doing that. We don't have to do that. We we don't have to sell whatever we make. We might give it away, or we might actually try. But it's to be part of the con canonical work is not our objective. You'll have a you'll have canonical works that will say, well, these are the best. Everything should be judged by these, and and we want our stuff to be called canonical too. But if you dig deep to see how how a canonical work becomes a great work of art, there's all sorts of social and ec and economic processes by which it, it it happens. And at other times, like okay, you told me about Ansel Adams, and I found that that photograph that showed the graveyard and the oil well in the background. And without saying anything about the environment, the earth or transformation, a light bulb, light bulb goes on in my head and I say, I, I experienced something close to, it's almost like the sublime. I'm fighting for the words to say what it was about seeing that first Ansel Adam photograph that you talked either you talked about i tell it to my caregiver and she goes home and talks to her father about it now that's what i think i want i want to see art do i want to see art pull us together into a community rather than necessarily have the isolated artist you know who's different and superior than everybody else with his vision i want him to be able to take that vision out so people who who might not, who might miss it, just find it interesting. Right. And he kind of talks a little bit about that um, in a roundabout way when he kind of talks about film and we can touch on that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a bit, I suppose. Um, um, Cause it, it's, it's kind of like, you I guess what? we'll kind of save it till we get to that section, but it's kind of like um, the actors not really being artists, especially in a capitalistic venture um but we'll, we'll save that for a second huh i guess we yeah, should probably and, we should and, probably and, back up and talk about 
how Benjamin saw, um, well, basically there's a quote, I'll pull this quote that he says, and it kind of, I thought it kind of distilled his thoughts um, real succinctly. He said, the uniqueness of a work of art is inseparable from its being embedded in the fabric of tradition. So basically he saw the reproduction as a separation from the original work of art. So mm. he sees the he sees the mechanical reproduction or production of it as stripping away the aura. And then he had uh -huh. another quote where he says in, in his words, basically when you reproduce the art, uh, you emancipate the work of art from its parasitical dependence on ritual. And that kind of, those kind of two statements there kind of capture what I kind of think was his, he was trying to get at with the whole thing. So basically like you reproduce it, it removes the here and now, and it kind of removes the history from it. Um, so I was thinking of like a, a, a real life example from myself was when uh, I was in this, I went saw the Sistine Chapel, but I mean, I went to the, the Vatican and toured. It was amazing yeah. the amount of art they had that I'm sure at one point yeah. was controlled and not exhibited. Um, yeah. And that kind of goes to the cult value where um, it was kept in a controlled space and refused to the masses, right? But now mm -hmm. it's kind of like, you know, everybody's seen a picture of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And he's uh -huh. saying that kind of strips the here and now from it, which would part of that would be like the history. So when I was there yeah. and saw the, the Sistine Chapel and, and looked up, um, I could have been more underwhelmed, but it would have been difficult. But the guy next to me, the guy next to me looked like he just had some profound experience. And that all has to do with the background and, you know, what he sees in that work of art. So, so what he saw versus what I saw, I think is what Benamin is getting at. It was stripped out for me because I yeah. didn't have the historical background yeah, yeah. to appreciate it in the way that the guy next to me did. And so when you reproduce it, it doesn't have that, that essence is, is not carried forward. You know, I saw, I saw this, this movie uh, recently. It was called The Scarlet and the Black. And it was about Rome during the Second World War. And it had Gregory Peck in it and Christopher Palmer. And those are two really, Peck is right after World War II and Christopher Palmer is now around as a pretty old man. You might not know either of them. But it was about a, a priest who was mostly smuggling Jews and other people out of Rome after the Nazis occupied it when Italy, Italy surrendered during the Second World War. So that's that's enough context for you, for me to say, well, so that's what the movie's about. But they also have Pope Pius X characterized as, as, a role, as having a role in the movie. And he's under a lot of uh, criticism historically because he didn't do enough for protecting the Jews. But the Catholic Church at least apologized, I mean, to Rome. But what I want what I want to say is I watched the movie and it was kind of melodramatic and but it was sort of okay. But then afterwards it turned out that the guy that was the Nazi colonel that was in charge of the Gestapo during the Second World War in Rome came was was tried for what he did for war crimes and sentenced to life in prison. And the priest who he'd had dialogues with, who hated him, visited him every year and every month in prison in Rome. And in the end, that guy who visited him, who had fought, fought against him, the priest getting the guys out of Rome, confirms him as a Christian. Okay, well, it's it makes a much more interesting story. I mean, I, I wish, I wish, I wonder what those two guys talked about in the cell, you know, what about them was, see, but see, if I, if I just looked at the movie, I would say, well, it's just a Catholic apologist movie, you know, it's just trying to make the church look good. 
And that's what, well, yeah, it is, but with this other information, it's still kind of interesting. You know, it doesn't solve the question, but it allows us to talk about it in a different way. You know, there's, hey, yeah, talk about the nature of evil and talk about a lot of things. So geez, I guess I kind of got going there, didn't I? But what I meant was it's the additional information about the text. Sometimes it helps you. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's just, just stuff you got to scrape away. But then other times it might be useful. Like, again, if we talked about J.R.R. Tolkien, well, I was the first scholar that actually talked about the fact that he fought at the Somme, the worst battle in World War I. And I agree that it profoundly affected his work. Other critics would say, well, you can never take something biographical and expect it to inform on literature. Well, I can and I did, you know, guys write books about that. And so the the, the literary, oh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that Sistine Chapel, it can be a place to start a dialogue, you know. What, what does that guy see and what do you see? And what did they see in in Michelangelo's day, you know, when they had almost they had almost no art. Well, I don't know. But the but it's not one kind or the other. It's sort of it's a big conversation, I guess. That's right, I mean. and to kind of circle back and you know and kind of tie it in with the overall theme, I think of his work is that. What that guy saw versus what I saw was kind of like, by definition, was like the aura. And ah, seeing, it, yeah, see, seeing, it, seeing, aura. seeing it stripped stripped away, like in a just a book, like a reproduction or something, the aura is stripped away. But Benamine actually favors the loss of the aura because he felt yeah. that the mechanical reproduction was an opportunity for the masses. So it removes the status from the art. And then it kind of takes out what he would kind of see as the fascism within art. So, because by make, always, yeah, yeah, by making always. it available to everybody. Well taken. So, um, so I don't know. Yeah, we, I mean, we talked about film there. I mean, do we want to like go into just kind of more what he talked about in the work? Because um, the impression I got is that he doesn't really see uh, film as art. Um, and he kind of sees it more of like a perpetual uh, yeah. rehearsal and, you know, like by its nature, a rehearsal itself is an art. And then he also feels that like the actor is not acting for the audience, but they're acting for a group of specialists who they're subordinate to, like the director or, you know, people involved uh -huh. in the production so and then you kind of touched on it earlier so so basically because he sees things through a lens of you know like of like the reproducibility kind of stomping out fascism he sees like the actor having to be subordinate to all these people as kind of like relinquishing his humanity in the face of the apparatus so so like maybe you can talk about the difference. So he sees film, that, so he would think that film would, could be a vector for the masses to break out from oppression, but not necessarily like in the, like a capitalistic exploitation of film, like in, in the Hollywood way, where the movie yeah. stars are, are lionized and, you know, like there's a, there's kind of like the cult value there and then they're kind of like removed from the public. But I don't, I don't know, like, as I know one time you mentioned, uh, well, like uh, the Russians used film kind of like of of the common and it, kind of, it, it can kind of be like the communists can kind of use it to politicize art. Um, so I don't know if you want to touch on that at all or, or if you think, think well, I was off what, point on any of that, but that's kind of it. Yeah. Well, I do want to say that there was this movie came out in 1971 called Solaris. And it was about 
humans trying to talk, communicate with a sentient planet. It was, it was made in Russia. Actually, it was made in Russia, and it was written, it was based on a book by Stanislaus Lem. And I remember sitting in the theater. Nobody else got the movie in the science fiction group, and I did, frankly. I, they, they, they just, they just didn't, get, didn't get it. It scared them. And I said, this sure as hell is not socialist realism. You know, this is, this is something that has a powerful aesthetic beauty. And, and part of to say that is it's it's hard to prove, but I felt there was something different in that in that Solaris than there was in any other Russian contemporary communist produced film I had seen. So we, we can leave I, I don't know if we can we can talk about all of this. We we've been going about an hour now. I feel like what I, I feel like I that you're ahead of me and Benjamin right now. And what I want to do most is study and catch up and if you if you could send me your can you send me your points the five points about about the aura and stuff? oh yeah yeah uh, and w i can tell you one thing about the frankfurt school we are we are doing frankfurt school type of production because what they were interested in is everyone would have a voice you would know something about things and you would have an apparatus by which you could communicate. And in the way of communicating, you would democratize the production process. And I mean, we're doing this, we could be watching, we could be watching cartoons or something, but this is just really interesting. I mean, my God, it's like being able to speak a language that I, that I literally haven't spoken 20 years, you know? Yeah, well, I guess we could just kind of end it on 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 touching on wh how how Benjamin would feel about like the internet and NFTs. I guess let's, bring it let's, towards the future. So, what do you? I guess what do you? What do you think? I guess the first thing is, what do you think he would? How would he feel about the internet? He would. He would understand it. Because one of the things it can do is it can supply you with commodified artistic projects stripped of their aura and stripped of the need to be in one time or place. I mean, one, once we finish this, this is going to be all over the world, you know. And if we say something new or even remotely interesting, then someone else might catch up on it and have something to add to the conversation. And not that we would necessarily solve anything, but at least we would we would have a kind of a dialectical process where we would know more and we would say, well, one thing I think Benjamin, if we can use this technology to study Benjamin, we could study just about anything. And if we could study in a way that, this is like a seminar, nobody's in charge, you know. You're not in charge, I'm not in charge. We can we can open it up, a public space for dis discussion. I think he would see the positive potential. Yeah, I agree, I think he would love it. Um, and I guess maybe we don't have to really go into NFTs um i want you know but i think what he would yeah. like is because i don't we don't want to necessarily get into like a technical discussion and i'm no expert on you know cryptocurrency or nfts yeah. or whatever but yeah. my understanding is is that there's potential to have like a large amount of decentralization um yeah. in these nfts depending you know what blockchain it's on or whatever but basically how much more can you can you um take the apparatus out of it and put it completely in the hands of the masses than to have something that's completely decentralized so i think he'd love it yeah well a friend of mine richard russell 
who I've known for 45 years from the Madison Science Fiction Group, talked about how that happened when we went from one computer in the computer science department, like at UW-Madison, to dispersed computers everywhere, having a huge processing power, you know? I mean, Moore's Law works, I mean, how many millions of computers, there's, there's probably literally millions of computers on the planet now, you know, and they're, and they're cheap enough, they're cheaper than food, you know, it's amazing. It's almost, it's almost like, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling for a, a word, Jan and Kathy are working in the kitchen too, but, but, it seems to me it, 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 all this processing power could could be could be a liberating tool. Right. You know, it, it it has potential for liberation, and actually, maybe some of the solution to this planetary miasma that we're living in now might might lie in in a community solution. We got to get a hold of Derek Baby. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm not, see, I mean, if if we had a a fusion switch, then we wouldn't need to burn coal, right? right? Yeah, it would be. Interesting. Have enough people. Yeah. Well, should, so, should we end it there, Phil, for our first show? Yeah.